Hi, and welcome to my channel. Can shooting on roll film and having bigger negatives actually save you money on your photography? Let's get into it. Film shooting is not cheap and anything we can do to get more value for our pound or our buck is, in my opinion, pretty worthwhile. Well, just for you guys, I went right back through many, many years of negatives, 35 millimeter and 120, that go back through my professional career, through wedding photography, uh, theatre photography, and right back to when I was learning my craft in my teens. Yeah, I still got the negatives from back then. And I found something very interesting. When I was shooting 35mm, I took three to four shots with very, very similar viewpoints and exposure settings on each subject almost as a matter of course. When I was shooting on 120 film, for whatever reason, because it's more expensive or because you get less shots on a roll, I was actually shooting around half that number on each setup or subject. When I looked at my hit rate, comparing 35 millimeter and 120, that's the keepers, the ones that I actually thought were worthwhile printing or putting online or, or whatever, there was actually a similar number for the 35 millimeter and the 120. So shooting less with the 120 was not harming my hit rate. This means, in fact, I was shooting less film for the same result. If you add that to the number of times, especially in my pro days, where I got to maybe exposure 28 and couldn't wait to finish a 35 millimeter film, I just wound it back and scrapped the end frames. Actually, that becomes uh, far more significant because the hit rate goes down. Right, let's start with film. There are fewer shortages of 120 color film than of 35 millimeter color film. Now, there are several explanations for this, and one of them is that um, cassette lids are made of a particular kind of steel, and that's actually been quite uh, in short supply in the last few years due to the pandemic and various other things. The other reason may be simply that um, 120 roll film is less popular, so it's not selling out as quickly. There are certainly lots of good deals on 120 film if you poke around and look for them. Last year, I got these two five packs of T-Max 100. Um, very, very cheap. Um, they're slightly short dated, but not by a great deal. And they are now living in my freezer until the better weather comes along for portrait and landscape work, and I haven't used T-Max much in the past, and it's a great opportunity to experiment. T-Max is actually quite uh, an expensive film normally, but the great thing is that there are actually lots of really well-priced 120 roll film in black and white on the market. Um, not the least is the new Harman Kentmere, 120 roll film in 100 and 400 ISO, which is silly cheap. You have foam pan, which I have had issues with in the past with pinholes in the emulsion, but I think with a bit of care I could probably overcome them if I could actually be bothered to. Um, and checking on my list, um, there's in fact rolly films, and some rolly films at the moment are very, very affordable. And last, but by no means least, um, we have Shanghai GP3 from China. Um, 
And this is interesting because it's also available in 220. In fact, it's the only double length. Um, in other words, 24 exposure on 6.6 film that's actually still available. Well, in fact, it's being reintroduced. Cheaper film is actually less of an issue with larger negatives. Grain plays less of a, a problematic role than it would do with 35 millimeter. And in fact, you can probably be a little bit um, sloppier with your developing techniques as I sometimes am and get away with it. I also, for what it's worth, find it easier to load a developing tank with a 120 roll film than I do um, a slightly reluctant 35 millimeter 36 exposure film, which can um, get quite tight towards the end. Okay, down to cameras. And you see me slightly surrounded by big flashy looking things like my RB67 and even my twin lens reflex, uh, the Mia C330. But you can start in roll film for super cheap. This little camera belonged to my father when he was about nine or 10 and is an Ensign full view box camera. A bit like the Mamiya twin lens reflex, you look through the top and you have a separate viewing lens. This one even has a little, if I can pull it out closer, I can't pull it out at the moment. Ah, that's it. <laughs> uh, close up attachment for portraits. Um, these can be found for pounds and they will give you similar kinds of results to a plastic Holger um, camera, which a lot of people find uh, quite fun to use. These, I think, are a bit more solid um, and you're saving um, an old camera from going into landfill if you use something like this. Great fun. Next up from the Humble Box camera, really has to be a camera that was probably more popular than anything else with amateurs for many, many years. And that is the roll film folding camera. This lovely old beast is an Agfa Billy record, which again belonged to my father. I believe he acquired it in Germany um, during the early 1950s. And this one takes six by nine centimeter shots on roll film, big old negatives. Um, and the great thing over the box camera is this one has settings. You have a focus setting. It's in zones, but it's in, um, in meters. Uh, you have um, four or five shutter speeds and you have apertures. So you can actually control your photographs. And this, this is a fairly basic model. There are obviously much more sophisticated ones by, in particular, um, Zeiss, who produce cameras like the Netar and the Iconta. Fabulous cameras, um, great fun, super lenses. I mean, very, very sharp. Um, yes, they involve generally a little bit of guesswork because most of them aren't rangefinder. In other words, the only way that you can accurately determine your focusing point is either by measuring it or by guessing it. Or with some of them that have a um, little shoe on the top, um, accessory shoe, you can fit a separate range finder, which a lot of people did back in the day, and that works quite well, but slows you down considerably. These are super pocketable. Um, I'll fold this one up, and that literally will go into a jacket big jacket pocket or a coat pocket um, very comfortably uh, and super nice to take out with you as a carry anywhere camera. Oh, I should point out that folders, mostly the Zeiss ones, are available in a whole um, host of different formats. So you can get 6x4.5, 6x6 centimeter and six by nine centimeter. I think there might be a couple of six by seven ones, but six by nine is certainly uh, a little more popular amongst folders. Um, this of course is great because uh, you can have 15 shots 
on 6x4.5 can have 12 shots on 6x6 and 8 shots on 6x9. The things to watch out for with these are obviously, as with any old camera, things like fungus in the lens, whether the shutter is working properly at all speeds, and particularly with these um, pinholes in the bellows. So you want to get this up, if I can get the back open, get this up to a bright light, really bright light, an LED torch or something like that, and shine it uh, through, and sometimes you can do it from inside, um, and just make sure there are no pinholes in the bellows. If there are the odd tiny pinhole, it's not a killer thing. It can be fixed. Uh, there I have a whole episode about fixing bellows pinholes and I will put a link in the description to that. I would aim to spend 50 to 100 pounds on a folding camera. I really wouldn't spend that much more. Okay, so perhaps you want something a little bit more sophisticated than a folding camera, but you still want to be budget conscious and you want interchangeable lenses. Well, this is one of my favorite cameras of all time. The Mamiya C series um, started with, I think, the C3, or in fact, the Mamiya Flex in the 1950s, um, and is the world's only interchangeable lens, twin lens reflex. So you look through the top and look through that lens and you take the images through that lens. Um, it has a bellows, which allows for super close focusing without any attachments and takes several interchangeable lenses. I've got a 180 millimeter and a 55 millimeter wide angle here. Um, and as far as reliability, price, and actually portability, because folded up, this is actually quite small, and this and two lenses go comfortably into quite a small gadget bag. Um, I find this to be a great carry anywhere camera, um, providing my shoulders feeling fairly strong. And I use it for everything up to street photography because it's actually very, uh, very easy to just look down into it and, and take shots and the shutter is actually very, very quiet. This is a C330. You can find earlier versions, the C33 and the C22, um, which are a little bit heavier and they have the kind of grey side panels. And they're equally competent cameras and they can be had for even less. You can get for under £200 a workable Mamiya C series camera. Uh, I would take one of these over a Yashica twin lens reflex like the 124G. I used to have a 124G, um, which I sadly damaged badly by dropping it on its front panel and it didn't focus properly after that. You can get yourself into the Mamiya C series system for around £250 for a C3 or possibly a C33. You have to be on the lookout and be patient to find them at the right sort of price. And you'll find that most people who have these wind up with a very small range of lenses. And in fact, when I shot weddings exclusively on these, I only used uh, in fact, 65 millimeter wide angle, but sometimes a 55 and a 180 short telephoto. And this is something that's fairly universal for large format cameras. You'll find that a very small selection of prime lenses are all you need. If I was shooting weddings on 35 millimeter, the temptation would be to have zooms and lenses galore. And you don't need it for roll film. Yes, I'm going to mention budget roll film photography and cheaper photography in the same breath as I'm going to mention the mighty RB67. A single lens reflex in the same 
kind of mold as the Hasselblad. Um, fully interchangeable lenses, a bellow system, which means you can close focus like the C330 without extra equipment. Um, extension tubes, extra backs, all the stuff that you need. These cameras have shot more top-end magazine covers than probably anything else in history. They are supreme professional pieces of kit. Uh, this one cost me £600 in incredibly good condition with a 127mm lens and in fact a prism finder. Um, I have spent no more than £1,000 on all of my RB67 kit and that is a perfectly good kit for going out and shooting absolutely anything. Okay, so it's not budget. Well, it is budget, but it's higher budget. It's an awful lot of camera for your money and more camera for your money, I would argue, than you would get for a top-end 35mm kit. So, don't be frightened of roll film. It can be cheaper than 35mm if you shoot it with care. And roll film cameras needn't cost you a fortune. You can start with a box camera and work up. So if you've enjoyed this video, why not hit the like button? And if you want to help the channel out, well, why not subscribe? It puts a big cheesy grin as usual on my face and we're heading up towards that magic thousand subscribers now. Also, do take a look at my Patreon page, the link's in the description. Uh, I've got lots of good stuff happening on there and a contribution there really, really will help to keep the lights on for the channel. So, until I see you again, take care of yourselves and remember, keep taking those medium format pictures. <laughs>